All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is PEXGS Weekly, episode 57, JavaScript News Podcast, bringing you all the best news of the week. And uh, if you can hear it, maybe a bit, I am a bit sick. Um, like, it was pr pretty bad yesterday, but I think it's better today. So, if you hear me being cranky or coughing or anything like that, this is exactly why that happened. So, uh, please forgive me for that. Hey, Uncle, welcome to the stream. But all right, so let us get to the news, which I totally forgot to open because I'm an idiot apparently, but uh, let me just open all those things in the tab so we can get started. We do have quite a bit of very interesting things to discuss today and um, just some releases and some really cool libraries and demos that we can talk about. There is also like, Significant amount of uh, WebAssembly related things popping up lately, which is kind of great. And we also have some very interesting and silly articles. Well, not so silly this time around, but very interesting articles to discuss at the very end of the podcast. So uh, stay tuned. Well, let's get started. The first article we got here today is benchmarking WebAssembly runtimes. And it talks about actually benchmarking uh, primarily new uh, version of Vasmer that adds a single pass uh, compiler called Dynasm um, that improves the performance marginally best basically. And uh, this is absolutely fascinating. So they compare the uh, runtime performance of uh, Vasmer with Rust native being the baseline, right? So they have the native Rust implementation and then they got the Vasmer with uh, three different backends, uh, DNAS, LLVM and uh, CLIF, which is, I believe the previous one. Uh, and then they use the Vasm C API uh, for V8 to basically just run it in the V8 itself, right? Uh, version 7.4. And uh, if you look at those comparison charts, the uh, Din Asm backend is performing incredibly well. It is, um, no, wait, sorry. This is, uh, I am, conf okay. I am actually confusing it with LLVM backend, right? So the LLVM, <laughs> let me try that again. The LLVM backend is actually performing better than uh, just about anything else including the uh, V8 API just for running the WebAssembly code, which is pretty damn impressive. So majority of the benchmarks stay within uh, one and a half, two times of native speed, which is quite an achievement to be honest. And then again, um, you know, this is the very basic benchmarking obviously, and it uses the artificial code here, but still the performance gains and performance improvements, quite impressive. So if you're curious in the more results, uh, do check out the article and uh, yeah, have a look at the comparison basically. Uh, I'm sick as well, light fewer. Well, Uncle get well soon. It always sucks to be sick. I can tell you that for sure. All right, uh, next thing we got here is a new React and the old cache. A really fascinating article talking about caching React on the server side, right? So uh, I did not know before reading the article that this was actually a problem. But turns out that, well, React is actually really fast on the front end, but if you try to render stuff on the back end, it actually can be very, very slow and uh, result, for example, in the large Amazon Web Services builds, which is something I never actually considered. So it turns out that, you know, rendering on the server can be slow and using cache can obviously help you with it, right? So this article goes to talk about the approaches to caching React on a back end, as in rendering to string, and different libraries that allow you to do that. And for example, the uh, most favorite, it seems the community choice Repscallion, which was working till React 16 and then stops working uh, due to the React changes. I don't know if they actually updated it or not. Will be interesting to check. But uh, yeah, it's essentially talking about those existing libraries that can help you cache um, backend uh, rendered pages and components to faster, to allow for faster server-side rendering, which is a very interesting problem. I never, as I said, you know, I never even thought that was a problem before reading this article. So if you are dealing with server-side rendering, if you're working with React and you wanna speed up your things and optimize them, make sure to read this article. There are some very interesting things in here. All right, next thing we got here is I used the web for a day on Internet Explorer 8. Um, yeah, that sounds, I mean, the article is just as terrifying as it sounds. 
Trying to open the modern internet using an Explorer 8 is, oh God, yeah, that's, that sounds scary. Just, just, you know, just from the title of it. I personally had to work with Internet Explorer 8, I think on one project, and it was a major pain even back then, even when we had polyfills and everything, it still was annoying as hell because there was so many caveats. And what the author here does is actually looks at um, the browser share, first of all, you know, how big is the Internet Explorer share in general in the global market, and then per country. It's actually, it was very surprising to see that some countries still have the Internet Explorer 8 usage above 3%, which is insane. Like this is a really big market share. Like countries like Iran, countries like uh, Eritrea, they all have E8 usage above 3%, and this is just crazy. So the article then goes into, you know, demonstrating how some websites just plain out don't work with uh, Internet Explorer 8, including the pretty big ones like Google, like YouTube, like, uh, GitHub, unless you enable the modern versions of TLS, which actually fixes it, and so on and so forth. And majority of times you get warnings that say, hey, your browser is actually no longer supported, which I mean, EA8, to be fair, is end of life. I think it's been end of life for quite some time now, right? So it's fair that it's not supported, but you should at least see a warning. And uh, the cool thing about this article is not just shows you how broken the web might be if you use EA8, but it also shows you what you can actually do to your website to make it work in Explorer 8 and that it doesn't actually take that much effort. Well, majority of time anyway. So if you are working in a business that, well, relies on the countries that have this, you know, insane um, EA8 usage, or maybe you have some legacy customers that you need to support, make sure to check this article, specifically the last part of it that talks about what do you need to do to support Internet Explorer 8. And how can you do this by using polyfills, Babel, um, uh, preset env, and so on and so forth. Because it's really good. It's actually really, really good. All right. Continuing, we got how we use WebAssembly to speed up our web app by 20x case study. So this, just as the title says, this is a really, really cool case study that talks about speeding up the performance of a data science app that allows uh, analysis of DNA sequencing data in the front end by migrating the logic from JavaScript to WebAssembly, which, I mean, you know, as you might imagine, this is probably gonna be the primary case for WebAssembly when you take the large amounts of data that are might be slow to analyze using JavaScript, and then you just do that with WebAssembly, which gives you, well, near native speeds, like one and a half, two times slower than native, uh, in some cases is not, you know, JavaScript is basically slower is what I'm trying to say. So um, yeah, this is exactly what they did, right? So they took this, um, uh, they took their algorithm, they written it in C, then compiled it down to WebAssembly and used the data produced by WebAssembly in the web worker to actually render the plot results in the front end, which resulted in, well, 9x speed up with a naive approach, let's put it this way and then 21x speed up with optimized WebAssembly code, which is just mind blowing. So if you're interested, the whole thing is open source. The article does a pretty great job at explaining what exactly they did. That sounds cool and interesting. Do check it out. It is really great one. All right, continuing, we got web components will replace your framework, uh, front end framework which is not exactly the title I would choose for the article like this. This is actually an introduction to web components and why they are basically good. I I don't know, maybe I just read it wrong or maybe it's my you know sickness kicking in, but I didn't actually find any arguments against frameworks and didn't find the, how web components address some of the things the modern front end frameworks address for us right now, like optimizing for size and bundling and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, I mean, in theory, you shouldn't need bundling when you use web components and you rely on imports, you rely on HTTP2, you rely on uh, parallel loading, but that still is slower than bundling and loading one nice uh, JavaScript bundle, right? Uh, this article doesn't really address us any of that, but it does give you a very good introduction to web components. So if you wanted to get started, do check it out. This is a pretty good starting point. Next thing we got here is how to use use context hook in React. Um, just a basic tutorial on how to use use, use context hook. 
um, and how to build your own uh, music player with a track list, which you can switch essentially using the context to orchestrate all of that stuff. Really straightforward, really simple. If you already know how the use context hook works, you won't really find anything new in here. Uh, but if you don't, then well, this is a pretty good tutorial. Next thing we got here is Cypress, making E2E testing easy. This is a tutorial for Cypress, a really good one actually that explains what Cypress is, why do you need E2E testing, and how does Cypress makes it a lot easier. I Every time I see articles about Cypress, it looks absolutely awesome, but so far I didn't have one case where I would need that and I couldn't test it, but I really wanna get my hands on it and just try it because the stuff that this article showcases is just absolutely awesome and the fact that you can run it locally makes it even better. So if you're interested in end-to-end -end testing for your front end um, then, or web apps, then do check this article out. It will get you started in no time. Next thing we got here is Node.js Readable Streams Distilled. A pretty comprehensive introduction to Node.js Readable Streams. Like this is obviously one of the types of the streams of, I think it's three types, right? So you got the readable, writable, and duplex streams. And uh, this is introduction to readable streams. Basically everything you need to know about them, how they work under the hood, what exactly happens, how do you process them, how do you consume them, how do you use, even how do you use async iterators to actually work with uh, readable streams. Um, not just using the existing async iterators, like for example, the create read stream, but actually write your own async iterator wrapper that allows you to consume any stream using async iterators, which is kind of neat. So do check it out if you are working with um, streams in Node.js and still confused about some parts of them. Next article we got here is creating a Spotify powered app using Nux.js. A pretty cool tutorial on how to uh, build a Nux.js and Vue.js app basically using Spotify web player and web API, which is kind of good. Like it, it's, it's, you know, it's not nothing super fancy here, but it's a very good tutorial, very well written, very large and very detailed, even starting from, you know, hey, let's install Node.js, install Git, register a Heroku account, register a GitHub account and stuff like this. So if you're getting into Vue.js or maybe you're just starting web developments, that's probably gonna be good for you. It is quite detailed. Next article we got here is an intro to Zero Server, a new tool to simplify web development. We have talked about Zero Server uh, some time ago. Um, I think it was, what was it? Three or four podcasts ago. And this is a tutorial that introduces you to the basic concepts of Zero Server, talks about the features like auto configuration, file system based routing, depend auto dependency resolution, multiple languages support, and so on and so forth, right? Now, the tutorial itself is quite fine and they give you some good examples here. Um, what they also talk about is bootstrapping an e commerce application with Zero Server. Now, even though I think Zero Server is a really cool tool that allows you to prototype things in a quick way, I would not use it in production and I would not use it specifically for e-commerce apps because you just don't want to rely on all this magic under the hood in production, especially for something as crucial as e-commerce stuff. So yeah, you know, um, take it with a grain of salt essentially, but it is a good introduction. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is auto. Let me try that again. <clears throat> auto authentication and authorization to Next.js eight serverless apps using JSON Web Tokens and GraphQL. This is an article from uh, Hasura guys, actually the Hasura uh, GraphQL engine, which is super easy to set up. And this is exactly what they talk. So how to um, use JSON Web Tokens along with GraphQL and Hasura engine specifically to authenticate your Next.js React app uh, with Apollo client. So if all of that combination sounds interesting, do check it out. If you already know how all of that works, then you won't really find anything new here. It is a very basic tutorial. Next thing we got here is why I publish and manage JavaScript, uh, shared JavaScript code with Bit. Uh, so this is an introduction to the tool called Bit. Um, again, I guess that should have been a disclaimer, but this is actually an article in the Bit blog. So this is from the company that makes Bit. Uh, and it's overly excited about their own tool. I mean, I guess it's okay to be overly excited about it as long as you dis disclo bleh, disclose that this is your tool, right? So take it with a grain of salt. 
Nonetheless, it sort of guides you through why bits might be better than NPM for some cases and how exactly do you use it uh, to split your app into separate components. It looks interesting, but I honestly am not convinced that this is better than NPM, for example. Maybe I just don't see uh, or don't have use cases that they address. But um, yeah, if, if you are working with the front ends a lot and you have to share the components, like singular components a lot, then do check it out. Maybe this is the tool you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Node.js Inside Out Modules API Rediscovery. This is a pretty nice summary of everything related to modules in Node.js, starting from uh, CommonJS, going to import exports, uh, globals, enabling, uh, you know, caching modules, ECMAScript modules, differences, and so on and so forth, including the hooks for loaders and stuff like this. So if you're still confused about some parts of the Node.js modules, do check this article out. It will basically um, explain, well, the majority of it basically, right? Okay, next thing we got here is how to use Axios with JavaScript. A pretty basic tutorial on uh, using Axios instead of fetch or, you know, any other request library. In this case, in the front-end app using Parcel Bundler, which is a nice way to start, I guess. So if you were curious about Axios and wanted to check it out, this is a pretty good tutorial. Next article we got here is great. <clears throat> just apologies, just a moment. Let me sip some tea. <laughs> so next article we got here is getting creative with console API. Um, this is a tutorial showing you extended features of console.log uh, and a bunch of other methods allow you to do things like style your um, stuff with CSS or group and trace things from the console or so console log, console.debug, console assert and other methods. If you are familiar with extended console API, then won't really find anything new in here. Well, if you are new to it, then do check it out. There are some pretty neat hidden features. Okay, next thing we got here is functional programming with JavaScript in three steps. Um, very, very basic introduction to functional programming in JavaScript. Uh, just basically uh, overviews what are the pure functions, what is the mutability, and what is declarative patterns, and why you should favor them, and how that might help you write a better code. That's basically all it does. Right, that is actually it for news and articles. Now we are coming to the uh, interesting tips and bits and stuff like this. And the first one we actually get here is the uh, this issue from the request.js package. <clears throat> the maintainer of request.js, uh, Mikhail, is actually converting request.js into maintenance mode. So it will no longer accept new features, it will no longer consider breaking changes, and basically the only thing they will do to the library is fix bugs, right? So if there's any bugs or any security vulnerabilities, this is the only thing that's gonna happen to it from now on. Request is a very nice library, but it's been out there for a very long time and there are better alternatives available now. Uh, specifically, Request is very heavy if you if you, um, if you haven't seen it. So if you go to package phobia and type in Request over here, you will see this almost five megabytes in size, which is just insane. Um, but yes, so there are basically better alternatives and it's time to put Request to uh, rest basically. Uh, the cool thing is that they have a second issue here that lists alternative libraries to request that show you the package name, bundle size, API style, and a short summary of the um, specific library, including stuff like node fetch, got Axios, unfetch, super agent, and a bunch of others. All of those are pretty great. So if you are looking for a placement for next uh, request JS, then do check this one out. You will definitely find one over there. Next thing we got here is serial promises versus parallel promises. Uh, what the title actually should say, it's a serial versus parallel promises execution because you don't really have serial and parallel promises, right? It basically showcases how you can run promises in series or in parallel and how you should do that depending on the use case, which is uh, one of the issues that I think a lot of people who just get started with the sync await encounter basically, it's, wouldn't call it an issue essentially, but it's sort of, you know, you just await everything in sequence and don't think about the performance of it. While in reality, you can actually use promise.all to await things in parallel and then make your code a tiny bit faster. So this is a pretty good introducer to that. So do check that out if this is uh, something that sounds familiar. 
<clears throat> Next thing we got here is quick debug using or with console.log. Uh, it's a neat little trick um, that basically allows you to console log arrow functions that immediately return an expression. So you just write console.log or expression, right? Which will execute console log and then return whatever is expected anyway. It's a nice way, but I personally more prefer using comma operator, which makes it a bit more apparent. Um, anyway, if, if you are using arrow functions a lot and if you are looking for a nice way to debug them, do check this article out. It gives you a bit more explanation of how exactly this works and uh, how you can use that even with TypeScript because there are some obvious TypeScript caveats related there. Right, next thing we got here is faster WebGL in 3GS 3D graphics with off screen canvas and web workers. Um, this is a crazy one. So it basically teaches you how to improve WebGL performance when creating complex scenes with 3GS by moving the render away from the main thread into a web worker with off-screen canvas. Um, if you are working with WebGL and, or I mean, even canvas JS, it's like off-screen canvas can be used to render just about anything, right? This one is pretty fascinating. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the new, uh, or I guess updated, um, React Flare proposal. It is a new umbrella proposal for React events that um, aims to extend React event system to include high level events that allow for consistent cross device and cross platform behavior. So essentially the gist is that we're going to have a single React event system that is going to be working the same way on all platforms, be it web, be it native, be it whatever you can imagine essentially, which is Kind of awesome. So if that sounds interesting, do check out the proposal. There's more details in the issue and there's already quite a lot of code committed. So might as well check that out too. All right, now we are coming to the releases section. The first release of the week, I don't actually have that many, but you know, that's just minor ones. Uh, the first release of the week is Next.js version zero, uh, 804, which just brings some minor uh, incremental improvements as well as the, I guess, deterministic builds being the biggest feature of this release. And then there's, yeah, like some performance improvements, some plugins and stuff like this. So nothing too major to be excited about. Next release we got here is, well, relatively big, actually. Uh, we got Safari 12.1 released finally with a bunch of um, pretty cool features finally shipped in Safari, which brings it kind of not quite up to par with Chrome, but you know, quite closer in, in, in terms of supporting web apps properly. Now we got the... Uh, I mean, okay, intelligent tracking prevention, upgraded payment request API, WebRTC improvements, uh, encrypted media extensions API, which means that uh, I believe, um, I don't know, did Netflix work in Safari before? Because I think they used AME, right? I'm kind of curious how that works. Um, we got intersection observer and web share API finally as well as a bunch of other things that are, you know, more minor. So if you are using Safari, I guess that's exciting news for you. If not, then I don't know, like, <laughs> it feels so weird that WebKit used to be uh, like the best engine out there and now is just lagging quite significantly behind the Chrome and even Firefox in, in quite a lot of features. So I mean, anyway, quite exciting news. I'm more than happy to see that also being shipped in iOS. All right, next release we got here is Visual Studio Live Share is now general available. <laughs> Let me try that again. Visual Studio Live Share is now GA, so generally available, right? And it's no longer preview, and now you can just download it and use it, and it's stable and nicely working and everything. I've used it more than once already to uh, share code and do pair programming with uh, colleagues, and it works amazingly well. So if you're looking for a solution like this, definitely check it out. Right, that is actually it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demo section. And the first library we got, oh, sorry, first demo I guess we got here is this one. Um, it's an Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe compiled to WebAssembly running in your browser um, like a full game. It, it actually works. You can start a new game, you can generate a plane, you can, well, you can do everything that you would expect from the game to do. And you can even run it in full screen or resize canvas, like it is insane. Like this thing actually works completely. And it has music, I just muted it because, you know, for stream purposes, essentially. 
So you can now just play Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe right in the browser, which is just on a full native speed. I mean, this this doesn't have any slowdowns for me. Like I played for 10 minutes before and it worked amazingly well. So I think we have quite exciting future in front of gaming and browser um, coming up quite soon. Like this is really, really cool. All right, um, next demo we got here is PeerJS, a uh, PeerJS library that simplifies web RDC peer-to-peer -peer data, video, and audio calls. The API looks really nice. So if you're working with WebRTC and want to simplify some peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfers, then do check this library out. This seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got here is Vex Chords, JavaScript chords chart. Uh, it allows you to render very nice guitar chords in the browser. I believe it is using SVG for that. Looks really cool. The API is also pretty slick. So if you are planning to do some sort of a Gitter page, I don't know, web app, <laughs> check this out, baby. This looks quite awesome. Next thing we got here is Jackpack. And I keep wanting to call it Jetpack for some reason, but uh, no, it's actually Jekyll plus Webpack combination that allows you to build a multi-page websites, uh, static websites uh, with ease essentially. It is not quite well fitted for single page apps. So it's more of specifically built around multi-page uh, static websites. That sounds interesting. Do check it out. Seems to be quite nice. Um, yeah, and you know, there's even some like uh, deployment for two S3 buckets baked in from the beginning. So seems pretty cool. Next thing we got here is PillJS. Uh, add dynamic content loading to static websites with only one kilobyte of JS. It's a really stupid and simple idea, stupid in a way that you know is very, very simple. Uh, what it does is essentially it's, uh, you invoke the pill by pointing to your content holder, right? And then the pill hijacks all the ahref links and loads them dynamically and then just replaces the whole content in the front end. That's basically all it does. It is very, very simple, but it seems to be working quite well. So if that sounds something like you would use, do check it out. It's dynamic content loading for basically any static website. There you go. Next thing we got here is Vade, a blazing fast one kilobyte search library. So this is a full text search in one kilobyte, which is damn impressive. I'm not sure how it compares to any other libraries in terms of um, precision performance and stuff like this, but if you want a full text search and you want it in one kilobyte, then there you go, you have it now. Next thing we got here is editor.js. This is probably one of my favorite uh, libraries of this week. It is a really cool uh, block editor that is basically free and um, available for everyone. If you used something like notion.so, the uh, new project management tool, I guess, um, then the editor is very similar to what they did, but it's basically open source. I, I actually really would really want to see the Notion editor open source, but I guess this would never happen because this is sort of the core of their product. But this is probably as close as you would get to it. It has blocks, you can do a ton of things. The blocks are extensible via plugins. The resulting data is rendered to JSON, so you can easily store it in, well, any database. And uh, yeah, there's like a ton of plugins for blocks, including, you know, I don't know, HTML warning table, and there's probably gonna be like a billion third party plugins. This thing looks really good. Written in TypeScript, tested and everything and licensed under Apache 2.0 license, which is also kind of awesome. So um, yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Mprove, open source business intelligence tool. Uh, unfortunately, the docs on the repo are not that detailed, but the website improve.io actually showcases quite a lot of cool things, including query building, uh, dashboard generation, fancy visualizations and stuff like this. So if you are doing uh, business intelligence over some data sets and want to simplify it, then maybe this is a tool for you. Next thing we got here is log process errors. Uh, show some love for Node.js process errors. This is um, pretty fire for Node.js error output that turns it from the plain text into a bit more formatted text that is easier to um, recognize as a human, I guess. It looks, looks fine, I don't know. I never had problem with reading the node errors. I mean, sometimes they can be a bit cryptic, but um, that definitely looks a bit nicer. 
All right, next thing we got here is PizzaQL, modern open source um, order management system for pizza restaurants. I'm not sure why would you like, it's a very specific, very niche product I feel, but <laughs> there's even a patron for it. So if, if you are running a pizza place and, and you want to GraphQL backend for it for order management, then there you go, I guess. It's, <laughs> I don't know what to tell anymore about this. All right, next thing we got here is formal, an opinionated React form framework. Unfortunately, there's no docs, only the storybook, which basically contains all the docs as well. But it seems to be a pretty comprehensive framework for working with forms in React. Uh, there is a ton of examples, different formatters, validators, conditionals, and so on and so forth, all with a pretty good um, I mean, I guess I would actually prefer to have a proper example instead of, you know, having to look at the story uh, book code, which is not too bad, but not exactly convenient. But yeah, if you're working with forms and we're looking for a React based solution, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Truel, a rule engine for Node.js written in TypeScript. Now this is a crazy one. It's actually a spreadsheet rule engine. And uh, what I got from the description is that it allows you to create a spreadsheet in, I don't know, um, Excel, Open Office, LibreOffice, whatever, right? And turn that spreadsheet into rules inside of Node.js to actually execute them upon some data, which, which is crazy. Uh, hey Donna, welcome to the stream. Thank you for your donation. Thank you for your support as always. Uh, yeah, so if you if you ever wanted to, for some reason, turn the spreadsheet into actual rules within the Node.js um, tools, I, yeah, I guess now you can. I honestly don't know what the cases for that would be. I guess one of the cases to sort of allow people who don't know how to code to manage rules. That looks crazy. Like... <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's quite impressive to be honest. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is Griffith, a React based web video player. Um, actually a really slick looking video player for React. Very simple API and uh, yeah, seems to have basically uh, support for just about anything you might want. Um, so if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Licensed under MIT. Next thing we got here is Heroku Cran Notes. Uh, how to use create React app with a custom node server on Heroku, sort of an exemplar, I guess. So um, if you are, you are wondering how to use the create React app application on Heroku, but were confused about some of its parts, then do check this one out. This will basically show you everything you got to know about it. Next thing we got here is water.css. Just add CSS collection of styles to make simple websites just a little nicer. Essentially a very, very basic style that makes your basic HTML just slightly nicer. I mean, I, I, I guess this exists. I'm not sure why, but there you go. Next thing we got here is React Have I Been Pound, a React component for Have I Been Pound. And uh, yeah, it just does exactly what it says. It allows you to throw in the passwords as a property to components and the um, uses the render props to then show you if the um, password was actually been compromised already. Uh, from the Have I Been Pound dataset. And if you never heard about Have I Been Pound, then you should go uh, to haveibeenpound.com immediately and enter your email over there and subscribe to all the breaches because this is the best service ever. And it will actually literally notify you about your email being, your accounts being compromised or your passwords leaking somewhere, which is absolutely awesome. So there you go. Next thing we got here is online. This is the name of library is minus online. Uh, it's a tiny library that allows you to check if the internet connection is up either in Node.js or in the browser. It's really simple from Mr. Sindrisaurus as you usually expect it's super tiny, super easy to use basically. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is hyper editor, a backend independent visual composer for the web. It's essentially a page editor with a very rich functionality uh, based on blocks where you can edit and add blocks and uh, essentially yeah, do stuff like this, layouting. It's like, it seems to be very complex. I like even, does it support drag and drop? I think, yeah, I did drag and drop last time. There we go. 
It's just a bit quirky to catch it. This looks really impressive and seems to be very full featured and essentially just produces the markup that you can then save in a database. And uh, yeah, if that looks interesting, then do check it out. This seems to be pretty neat. Next thing we got here is uh, Solid, a declarative, efficient and flexible JavaScript library for building interfaces. Um, it looks like React, um, like, so here's the thing, it uses JSX, right? It has hooks, but just hooks. And it uses DOM, so it doesn't have a virtual DOM, which I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's fine. So it's, it's like, it's, it's an interesting take on it. But the thing is that it's about the size of React in terms of the install size, right? And I don't know why would you use that instead of React, for example, um, in, you're basically going to be sacrificing the whole React ecosystem to use something that looks like React but doesn't quite work like React. I'm not sure, but maybe you know why you need that. So there you go. Uh, hey, Mandaputra, welcome to the stream. Yes, I do have a new haircut. It's gotten warm here and it's actually much nicer with less hair. But uh, yeah, you know, I just had to get sick when <laughs> it's plus 20 outside, basically. Um, it's good for Wiki. Yeah, Donna, that that the wiki application sounds quite nice but i i mean i guess you could also make something like a website builder or something out of that but it's basically a page creator right okay continuing we got react native carplay a carplay with react native an extension that allows you to write uh things for carplay in on ios specifically because I, as far as i know carplay is just just the ios only thing that uh, yeah, you can just write React Native app and display it in CarPlay and interact with it from your main app, which seems to be quite straightforward. Um, so yeah, if you are working with CarPlay and wanted to do this from React Native, then to do check this one out seems to be quite neat. Um, next thing we got here is Stepper, animated numeric stepper component, which can be used to increment or decrement the value by clicking arrows. Uh, just as it says, it's a very, very basic number stepper like either horizontal or vertical with some fancy animations and uh, that's basically it next thing we got here is a you don't need jquery repo that uh, shows you examples of how to do query style dom ajax events like jquery but in plain javascript i think there's already been like a dozen of sites like this but um, that's a really nice collection it's also translated into uh, quite a lot of languages so if you're not too versed in English, then uh, you're probably not watching this podcast anyway, but uh, there you go. There's like a bunch of languages. And uh, I think the most important bit is actually this browser support table on the bottom that should have been on the top, but they do talk about browser support. So if you keep that in mind, you can indeed drop jQuery and just use the native features. Next thing we got here is REPL.it uh, Chrome extension, which is really cool. So they've added an extension that allows you to run any code across the web on REPL. Uh, the way it works is that essentially you install the extension, it automatically adds the button to run the code to, for example, GitHub gists or GitHub pages. And then you can also select any code on the page and then right click it. And there's gonna be try it on REPL.it, which will start a new REPL instance and run this code for you there, which is actually quite awesome. So um, yeah, if you ever wanted to try code really quickly on the web, definitely check this one out. I mean, Replit is a really great tool in general, and uh, this just makes it quite a bit better. All right, next demo we got here is, well, it's actually show uh, Hacker News post uh, because there's there hasn't been much description if you just open the website itself. But it's actually a demo that showcases the 300K lines of Java UI code running native in a browser at desktop speed. And they are not joking about it. So if you go there, there's an RM Studio Online um, designer. I think I already covered it at some point here, but back then it was actually quite laggy. And now you can actually run the whole thing, the whole Java application in the browser. It looks like Java, like without mistaking, this looks literally like Java app running inside of my browser on native speed, like there's no delay, there's no lag. I've tried drawing things, it works perfectly fine. There is samples, all of the animations, everything works really good. It is damn impressive. And 
yeah, the uh, if that sounds interesting, check out the demo itself and also make sure to check out the Hacker News comments because the people discuss how exactly they run it. So they use the TVM to compile Java to JavaScript, which is a really neat tool, it seems. So yeah, it's it's <laughs> we used to have Java applets uh, before. It seems like we're going to have them again soon, but uh, using WebAssembly, which is, you know, I'm not, not quite against that. That looks actually quite good. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is a uh, use jQuery, an essential hook for your React application. Uh, yes, it is a React hook. And yes, it really loads jQuery dynamically and allows you to use it in your React app. I, it was a first, first uh, sorry, the April's full joke. It's hilarious, but it actually works and you can actually use that. I don't know why you would want that, but um, <laughs> yes, this thing now exists. Uh, another April's full joke is the no fucks from J Phelps, an unpredictable state container for JavaScript app. That is, yes, uh, it's, I mean, it's unpredictable, but you can store state in there and maybe it will work basically. That's, that's the gist of it. So <laughs> it's quite hilarious to actually look through the source code. So yeah. All right, um, that's actually it for the libraries and demos. Now we are coming to the last bit of interesting and silly articles. We don't really have any silly stuff today, but we do have some very interesting things that are kind of related to software development. Uh, the first thing is this simple and boring article that is really long and talks about being simple and being boring during software development uh, and why sometimes it is actually better to be boring rather than to invent something new, right? Um, there was a quote that I wanted to read. Now, I, absolutely, I, I, I knew I should have bookmarked it somehow, but uh, yes, there you go. Boring should not be conflated with bad. There is technology out there that is both boring and bad. You should not use any of that. But there are many choices of technology that are boring and good, or at least good enough. MySQL is boring, Postgres is boring, PHP is boring, Python is boring, Memcached is boring, Squid is boring, Cron is boring. The nice thing about boringness, so constrained, is that the capabilities of these things are well understood. But more importantly, their failure modes are well understood. I think this sort of summarizes my approach that I've taken to the software development in the past, I don't know, three years or so, right? It's it's okay to use old boring technology. It's okay. It's even better sometimes to use old boring technologies because when you use something for five years, you understand exactly what's going to go wrong. You know, all the shortcomings, right? And when you pick up something new and hyped and trendy, you never know what might fail, what might go wrong and what kind of limitations does it have. So yeah, the, the whole article is essentially littered with a really cool uh, quotations and thoughts from different uh, web developers and scientists and uh, engineers. So do check this one out. It is actually really cool. Um, the next article we got here is kind of related to that. It's called You Are Not Google. And it talks about, again, selecting technology for doing something. And uh, talking about, you know, using stuff like Ma uh, MapReduce or Hadoop when you don't actually need any of that uh, or picking a backend in case or sorry, picking a database for the case that actually wants really work for you. Right. Uh, so he specifically talks about so the company considered Cassandra because Postgres uh, query was taking minutes uh, and they only had a table with 50 million rows. 80 bytes wide. So that's actually very little um, data. And they was like running a query that took two minutes. It is insane. Uh, so it would take about five seconds to be read in its entirety off SSD, right? So this is the takeaway from the guy who wrote this article, who seems to be an expert in databases. And it was two orders of magnitude faster than the actual query, right? Uh, why? And they was looking at the Cassandra, which was... Um, so the Cassandra was a database that was specifically made for uh, fast high writes capacity as far as I remember, right? Because this is from Amazon and they wanted to always store the data in the database when the uh, customer adds it to the shopping cart, right? So you want to be very fast on writing, but not so much on the reads. And there's like a bunch of other limitations obviously related to that. 
Cassandra would not have helped them, and it would have been, as he notes, the entirely wrong solution here. And just optimizing the query would be like way better. There is a lot of really cool examples here. So it seems like the author worked with quite a bunch of companies. And uh, one of the amusing ones is like, even Google is not Google. So he gives some examples about the stuff happening inside of Google that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a really, really neat read. So if you are, you know, if you're in a position that basically makes choices on the technologies, and I would highly recommend reading through this because it is fascinating how bad it could go if you just follow the hype. <laughs> All right, and the last one I want to cover here today is this article from Kotaku called How Bioware's Anthem Went Wrong. So if you're playing games, you probably heard about Anthem. If not, then Anthem is one of the latest uh, video games from a pretty big studio that is a complete disaster, right? So it's like there's no way to put it another way. It is just complete and utter disaster and disappointment to just about everyone. This article is very big and very long. It is like very detailed and it talks about why and how Anthem development went wrong. I thought it would be interesting to highlight it because 90% of the things mentioned in this article, they are not video game specific. So like there's majority of stuff the article talks about are not exclusive to developing video games. It's actually a lot of this can be applied to developing software in general. So if you are in the business of developing software, if you are, again, maybe you are even in a position of the person making decisions, this is the article to read. Like it talks about how the studio essentially took an idea that was really good. They started with it six years ago, and then everything went so bad that the original idea is nowhere to be seen. They burned through millions of money and the resulting product is just complete garbage. And all of that because, well, there's two reasons, right? Mismanagement and poor technological choices. Uh, in this case, the technological choices were actually forced by the higher management because of the studio stuff. But it is absolutely fascinating to read stuff like this. And if you, you know, even if you um, basically, if, if, if you have even the slightest interest in the software development, don't even like disregard the gaming part here. Like it's even fascinating to read it from the gamer perspective as well, but just disregard the gaming part and read the article as an article talking about the software development. It is absolutely awesome. So would highly recommend looking into that. Right, that is actually it from my side. So this was uh, BXJS Weekly, episode 57. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned on the GitHub. Um, feel free to join our Discord server to discuss any of that or ask for help or talk about JavaScript. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. Meanwhile, I will translate that in a Google Translate because um, Spanish, no, no, what? No, detect language, bring it back. Bring back what? 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 <laughs> I'm not sure there was a correct translation. Fun today. Well, thank you, Donna. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed the podcast. I feel like Google Translate doesn't know Korean very well. So there you go. Okay. I think that's basically on a mute for me for today. I need to drink some tea because my throat is extremely sore right now. And uh, yes, hopefully I will get better by the Wednesday so we can have a development stream at one point. There is some improvements need to be done to our uh, BXJS weekly bot. And uh, yes, let me throw that into translate again. Whoops, uh, that is not what I wanted. But you know what, I'm just going to open translate over here. And uh, the style is wonderful today. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Very happy to hear that. Um, I also hope that this is a correct translation. <laughs> But okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. Um, enjoy your rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're listening or watching this later on. And I see you next time. Bye.